Hi, I'm Jessica Franchuk. I'm an editor with Shieldwall Media. Um, on behalf of the Roll Forming Magazine and all of us at Shieldwall Media, I'd like to welcome you to the Construction Roll Forming Show. Uh, we're offering educational programs, as you can see, and launching the Con Construction Roll Forming Association as part of an effort to help encourage best practices and grow a safe and profitable industry. I'd like to introduce Drew and Jerry with Sherwin Williams Coil Coatings, and they'll be, gonna, they'll be presenting on Team 101 and High Performance. Well, I don't think the records are all Thank you very much. My name is Drew Waldrop. I will be the MC here at this afternoon. I'm going to sit here and run through what is our metal, high performance metal coatings presentation. We'll talk a little bit about why we paint, how the paint is made, how it's applied to the substrate, um, end uses, how it's tested, um, and then we'll uh, finish up with some questions. So, And as we're going through this, uh, I'd like to keep it. Uh, Discussion format. If you guys have any questions, please feel free to interject when something comes to mind. Start with how we, why we paint. A lot of times people just think it's for color or aesthetic, but it's for protection, uh, decoration, uh, to save energy. Total cost of ownership of your home can be highly improved by a solar reflective coating on your roof and. Uh, high metal defects of varying types. Difference between coil and extrusion coatings. Uh, coil coatings, the coating applied to the flat sheet of metal in a continuous process. It's a pre-painted, post-formed application, whereas extrusion is various aluminum profiles and it is coated after the fabricating process. Uh, would you guys be alright sitting in the dark? Sure. 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 Coating components, uh, pigment, which is the color, which is what most people see, but is actually the smallest part of the total coating package. Resin, which is the binding agent or the glue, that's what really gives uh, the coating its, its substance and its different uh, physical properties, where we distinguish between polyester, siliconized polyester, and PBDF coating. It's the resin types that make those differences. Solvents that add blue is how we, you know, paint it, how we thin it out um, for different applications and different uh, coil lines and additives. Flow mod, uh, different additives have to be added to, depending on which coil line we're running it on, or again, depending on which um, particular coating technology we're speaking to. Go ahead, Jerry. So if you went to a paint store, buy a gallon of paint. This is basically the same thing you would see. It has those four major components in it in a gallon of paint, except that what you're using at a paint store or a Lowe's or Home Depot, that you'd be putting it on with a roller or a brush net to air dry. Our coatings are based on at high temperatures of 450 to 465 degrees Fahrenheit on, on the foil, on metal. Our coatings are made for metal only not for wood surfaces or drywall or any of that. This is all for coatings that are put on metal substrates. Yeah, when I speak, when I speak to, you know, someone at my child's soccer game, I'm like, oh, you work for Sherman Williams. He loves the dove gray, but the fingerprints. I'm like, no, it's not what we do. I, I tell them, think of a big, giant piece of metal, roll of metal toilet paper. You run down the road on these big rigs. That's what we paint. And that usually drives home a little easier than coil coating, but putting in perspective, uh, these coating technologies are all put together in a, in a layer that is thinner than a, a human hair or a cellophane wrapper on a cigarette package. It is thinner than, um, than those two things here. And it all goes right there. So, how many of you use painted metal right now? Everybody, everybody in the room? Well, think about that metal substrate and it's painted. So with the primer, and the top coat on it, that's the thickness of it, equivalent to a strand of hair. I don't know if there's any smokers in here, hope not, that everybody's kicked that habit, but I brought a piece of 
wrapper for a cigarette pack. So if I take that cellophane paper off that pack of cigarettes, it's one thousandth of an inch, one mil. That's the total thickness of the paint that is on your mouth. <coughs> so think about it. That's the total thickness. Not like an automobile that would have multiple layers and coats on it like an automobile finish or your Jeep or your truck and that. It's much different for thickness on the coating on actual, on the metal building, on the roof, sidewall, and roof panel. This is a breakdown of the components again and their individual functions. Without reading through each one of them, you can read. Like I said, the resin is the binder. That's the really the, the base of each coating technology. So your durability, the hardness, flexibility, all of those things, those, those functions are found in your resin. Pigments like we talked about, most commonly add color, is what most people think of, but those are used for hiding, your gloss can be affected by the pigment, uh, there are cor corrosion resistant properties in, in some pigments, uh, adhesion, film strength can be improved with uh, certain pigments as well. Solvents, uh, primarily uh, for viscos viscosity purposes, Leveling flow that at all is uh, improved with solvents, and then the additives, uh, depending on what the end use is, what substrate is going on, different additives can be added to the coating to meet those things. Now, we're not going to try to make you chemist, but for example, everything you see here in the solvent family in here is very critical that we add to the paint because when it goes on a paint line, how many of you have ever seen a paint line on this wall? Anybody you have seen a paint line? These are critical components of the paint so we can make it flow out and level right on metal on the paint line. But keep in mind, we're running 450, 465 feet a minute, ensuring that that, but we're, some lines are running 700 feet a minute, so we have to be able to make sure that paint lays down. No two paint lines in the country are the same, so we have to formulate the paint that is going to work on each of those paint lines and ensure and give you the physical properties that you want on that panel. So these are all key components and when we turn the lights on I'll actually let you see them and that so you'll be able to correlate what, what he's talking about in here. And just to reiterate the resin is the backbone of the coating and there's different resin families like you said for polyester, for siliconized polyester and for the Kynar high performance type finish and it's critical that resin, again, is the backbone, tells you how that product is going to perform, what the life cycle is going to be, and the durability of it's going to be in the, in the field when you actually expose it. Back to pigments, I don't know if all of you may have heard, there's a whole new family of pigments out there now called solar reflective pigments. So it's a whole family now that, re that is required that we put in almost all of our coatings that are solar reflective. And we can go over that with you once we get the lights on. Dig into the pigments a little bit. This is what they look like in their powdered form. That's how we buy them typically. Limited to create the desired color for the aesthetic or application. Um, some of the functions of the pigments there. They're split into two different types. There's organic and inorganic or ceramic pigments. Uh, organic or carbon based. Um, uh, developed out of oil-based, petroleum-based compounds, uh, typically less hiding, and but you need to, these are needed to achieve the very bright colors. You know, again, proceed with caution with some of the bright colors. You have know, uh, display of some of our exotic colors up there. Warranty can be affected uh, as you get into brighter colors, your oranges and reds. Um, and then the inorganic chemical uh, pigments, excuse me, they're min mineral-based. Uh, complex metal oxides, they offer a superior color stability, a little more hiding power. Um, those are your earth colors and natural colors. Here you want to speak to the exotic colors a little bit. Yeah. Now, on the one on the left, you see the wheel there with exotic colors. <coughs> and they fall under the family of organic pigments. They, they're nice, they're sharp, they're bright colors. A lot of people use them for accents or corporate identity colors. The problem with those colors are they have very poor performance for long term. You might get five years, maybe ten years out of them, depending on the geographic location. And that you'll see something that will weather very well in Ohio, but if you took it down to Florida, it may only last three to five years. 
So we caution people whenever when we get color requests or chip comes in from our clients, our customers, and says, hey, can you match this color? Right away, our lab will say, hey, you do need to advise the customer that the pigment that's going to be required to make that color have very, very poor durability and they will not weather well. So if they're looking for something that's going to last for 20 years or longer, that's not the family that we want to be in. And that. So they have a very short life cycle. So, and I'll go into more detail and show you a little more detail once we get the light. Uh, to circle of background on solar reflective pigments. Um, the solar reflective pigments are used to alter both physically and chemically to reflect the infrared radiation while absorbing the light at the same time. So solar reflectance is just that. It's certain pigments reflect light um, at a higher percentage than others. So to, in order to be to meet energy star rating, it has to reflect over 25% of the light's radiation, or 0.25. You can see that on most standard color cards in the industry. Now, on solar pigments, at one time, the government was given $1,500, $2,500 rebate if you use that type of pigmentation on your roof. And that, so you would get a tax credit for that. Now, <coughs> most of that has gone away. I understand they're reviewing it right now, and they may re-implement it, but I think it's in a holding pattern right now. So when that started, and it started on the West Coast and worked its way towards the East, is that all of a sudden people said, hey, we need to have solar reflective, and it has to meet energy star requirements. The architects now started writing in all their specifications, and that, so we had to develop and work hard with R&D to come up with a whole family of pigments to give us that solar reflectivity. So it's a whole family different than the standard pigment. And it also varies for steep slope. Um, there are more colors available, and that's our value <coughs> for steep slope. Uh, white is the only one that meets um, otherwise. We have so some that other colors that are turned on colors that we still meet the energy star requirements. Again, this is strictly for roof applications. That's where it deals, not on your wall, sidewall applications, strictly for roof. And that. So we've had to work very hard to develop a whole family of pigments because not every, very few people want a white roof. They want colored roofs. So we've had to come up with a family of pigments that meet those requirements. And so we have done that and been very successful in the marketplace. Uh, specialty pigments, mica, metallic. Uh, mica is small metal plates that alter the light and give us a wide uh, array of different uh, optic options here. We have micas and metallics, and when we turn the lights back on, we have several different samples up here of the different four polymer base, um, metallic, mica, color shifting pigments, uh, and intense sparkle. Those are um, Sherwin-Williams um, named the Nova, Rustica, and uh, Chameleon. We have, we have much better uh, demonstrations up there than what we can show you on the slide deck here, right? Circle back around the resin. Um, again, they're the binders that provide the fundamental physical properties for the coating. Uh, again, it's the glue that really that is, the, is the backbone uh, of the coating. Uh, the durability, hardness, flexibility, and adhesion properties are all found in, in the varying uh, resin types. Hold on, please. Sure, sure. You see the cup that the gentleman has in his hand? Mm -hmm. There was a word on the screen that you probably didn't understand before called viscosity. That's the thickness of the paint. And the paint. So what he has, this device is called a Zahn cup, and he's measuring how many seconds it takes for that to break off. That tells you what the viscosity of the paint is. That's very critical, because if it doesn't have the right viscosity, it's not gonna work on the paint line when we apply it. And, that, and again, we're putting this on at very high speed, being baked out in ovens at 465 degree temperature. Resin types, we touched on it briefly, but your standard polyester, uh, generic polymer systems, limited weather performance, uh, colors can vary. You know, your typical end uses are, you know, you can see here the downspouts, your gutter, your or interior uh, liner panels can be uh, your standard polyesters. 
these resin types do not hold up well to UV degradation. Whenever you touch a downspout and you get the chalky resin on your hands, that is the aftermath of the UV rays actually baking out the resin out of the coating, and that's what that resin is left. Uh, that happens quicker than polyester. In other words, the UV sun will penetrate down through the coating and cause it to oxidize, and then you'll see the pigment run off. Some of you have seen old aluminum binding at home, and they have brick on the bottom, and you've seen the white run off, the chalk on the brick. That's what happens. People think it's a self-cleaning process that's taking on, but what's happening is the pigment is eroding from the weathering and the oxidation, so it's running down. So, and again, you got to remember, it's only on there the thickness of a strand of hair. So we caution people, don't go out there and scrub the side of your siding or the hard abrasive or brushes or grillo pads or anything like that because that's the only thickness you have on that paint on there. So you got to be careful. Otherwise, you go down to the bare or it's down to the bare metal. Uh, next is what they call high standard or siliconized polyester, referred to as S&P in industry. Our trade name is Weather XL from Sherwin Williams. This is what you see primarily on your on your metal building, your your agricultural end uses, um, ag panel as it's referred to. Uh, provides a harder surface, is better with color retention than uh, your standard polyesters considerably. Uh, good weather resistance, exceptional hiding of substrate, and a lower cost versus the PBDF, which we'll we'll get into shortly. Yeah, um, this is probably our biggest product line in the ag business. So I don't know how many of you are using coated metal. How many of you know what S and stands for? Or you understand what siliconized polyester is? Okay, some of you are saying yes. So that's probably one of our biggest bread and butter items and we offer a couple different looks in that. And just I'm not going to try to go up on a tangent, but we offer a smooth finish on that and we have recently developed in the last couple of years a product called Crinkle Coat. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it's got a textured finish on it, which has become very popular in that market, especially for roofs. And that. So, so when we look at these three categories up here, we see good, better, best. So if we wanted to classify. So that one there in the middle is probably the biggest one for ag. When we get to the one on the right, and not to get ahead of my partner here, but the superior performance is 70% PVDF. That's the high-end architectural product with the best pigment, the best resin, the best performance in the marketplace. That is the premier product in the marketplace for that for no and, But we have people who use that for roof. They also use the SMB for roof. Both both coatings. Yeah. PBS they do offer a much stronger color retention. Uh, it's quite a bit more flexible as well than what your uh, siliconized modified polyester would be, so standing seam application, uh, CBDS are recommended. And you can see the characteristics where it has excellent weathering, outstanding color stability, and that. So that is, product has been out for almost 53 years. And that, that product is a special resin system, PBDF polyvinyl vinyl um, coating. Not to get too into the weeds on, on warranties and, and such, but typically um, your your PVDS will have a less film integrity warranty than what your s and will, but a longer color retention and chalking warranty. And also the, I would say this, the color does not have to fade as far in a PVDS to be a warranty claim. And your PDF. So, I'm sorry, nobody wants to hear the whole thing, but I'm going to turn that off. So, yes, as I was saying, the, the fade does not have to fall as far in your PDF as compared to uh, your SP. The, the delta E measurement is much less. So, like I said, the color retention is really what uh, the PDF <coughs> are known for. There we go. Breakdown of the resin comparison. If you go down to the fifth line there, you can look at the film integrity, your warranties. Uh, 5 to 20, 10 to 40, 20 to 35. Up to 
coating manufacturers certainly want those on the uh, on the strong end of those of those guidelines. Uh, Weather XL comes with 40 year fill integrity warranty. Our floor polymers, for the most part, uh, 35 year fill integrity warranty. So as you can see, good, very good, and excellent on chocolate fade, weathering, loss retention, etc. What do you mean by fill integrity? Is it chip, steel, crack, plus the four characteristics of what we call a film integrity. Touching on solvents and additives, again, uh, solvents are used for viscosity, leveling, uh, and flow stability. Additives, um, again, allow us to kind of tailor each individual coating to uh, the individual coil line or end use of them. The coating manufacturing process is a picture of, uh, of one of our facilities. Um, it's all, you know, depending on which manufacturer, it's all painted or manufactured pretty much the same way. Uh, up to 75 raw materials, same ingredients, dispensed in each batch. Uh, it, you know, efficiency and production has came a long way in the coatings industry. And Jerry could probably speak to that a little bit better than I could, but uh, this is uh, not a good picture of the Dermont system, but the Dermont system is something that we have at our manufacturing facilities that allows us to take all these 75 raw, raw materials and have them in one place and shoot into one drum out of one spout with just uh, the program of a, of a code into the computer system. So this used to be hand mixed not too long ago. So you know, just a shot. what we call an automated dispense system. And that, so we can fill a drum, I think, in about 15, 20 seconds. To fill the drum. That's how fast it's perfect. We sell at our business, from our the coders, it goes in 55 gallon drum. So it's in bulk. The tanks in the back that you see are the holding tanks, and that will enable all the different components of the tank, and they blend it together. And then as you can see, in the lower left hand corner, he's adding one of the components to the tank, and then we do the physical testing on it, which we're going to explain that to you. But that would be the inside of what a coating manufacturing plant looks like. In the process, and we put everything, palletize it, and then it ships out to the coating line. And there's about 100 paint lines in the country that are active right now in the United States. So we ship all over North America. Get into the continuing coating, coil coating process here. Continuous coil coating is our applied and efficient, highly controlled process. This is a uh, I want to, this is a paint line. If you were, those of you who have been to a paint line and seen it, here's a paint line. This is what we call, pardon me, this is a pickup roll. So here's a pan. The paint is pumped into this pan. Here is a pickup roll. It goes, it transfers over to the applicator roll, and then it goes on to the prime metal right here. And you've got to visualize that this is running somewhere between 400 to 700 feet per minute. So if you've done a lot of paint rolling at home for the rollers, this is vision with vision. These are probably anywhere from 48 to 70 inches wide. And that each of them has to have a particular speed that they're running so they can properly pick up the right amount of paint. And when you see this up here, it's got to be the thickness of a hair, one mil. That's what the application is on there. That's how go here. Walking through this because Here we go. this is the, the steps in a typical coil line. So it comes in as your giant roll of steel toilet paper and it's uncoiled, uh, enters the accumulator, and then runs through a pre treatment and a cleaning process. The substrate always needs to be cleaned and pre treated first, it runs through an oven to dry off those pre treatments, or, and then runs through the prime coater, which Jerry same process that Jerry was showing you earlier. The primer is cured on in a curing oven, again, all while running 700 feet a minute, max through oven, um, varying temperatures, comes through the curing oven into the top coater where your top coats, where the you know, red, green, blue, whatever it may be, and then those are cured on again, goes through an X 
to the accumulator and then roll back up out to the individual end uses that you got to be useful for. As a coding supplier, this is where our require our responsibility started. At this station right here, we have nothing to do with the metal. We don't make metal. We have nothing to do with the pretreatment. The coil lines by the pretreatment. But it's very important, as Drew said, you must clean the surface of the metal off. Make sure you have the pretreatment and cleaning done and it's dried off. Because if that does not take place and not done accurately, the primer and the top coat will not stick. It will just blow right off. So it's critical that with all these stages that it goes through, that everything is done in spec. And then our life starts right here, that we're responsible to make sure it's got the right amount of film thickness on it, the right physical properties. And then as you can see, that it goes through the paint line and then it goes to the recoil over here. From that point on, and I don't know what the next slide I can see, but it, that's what happens. And then at that point, <coughs> when it's on the recoil, then it goes out to the roll former. So all the different roll formers, when you get it, it comes off as a recoiler. And depending on how many, what gauge, what color, or metal you've ordered, that's where you would be at the finish stage right there. And then they ship to you, all that's done, and we do all the testing, and we're going to go over that with you. And that prior to you getting it, to make sure it's going to go through your equipment. And this is all continuous. The entrance and exit accumulators are what allows this to, to never stop. Uh, on the way in, the entrance accumulator expands up to what, six stories high, yep. and the exit accumulator is contracted. When it's being round, wound up, the inverse would be true. So the entrance accumulator would contract, the exit accumulator would expand, which allows them to be loading on the next coil, staple it, and then run the next run. All about... You have no margin out. for error, but we got to make sure everything is dialed in correctly. There's a line in Wabridge, Ohio, that has one mile of metal in it at any given time. 5,280 feet of metal is running through that line. I think it's 450, 500, 600 feet a minute. We got to make sure everything is done in sync and to specification. So when that line shuts and checks, they do all the physical properties to make sure the right characteristics are on that finished product when it comes out. That's the hardness. I'm going to show you that. The pencil hardness, flexibility, film thickness, and that. And importantly, does the color? Is the color what you want? So this is a, a profile view of what a piece of painted metal would look like. You have the backer, primer on the backer, and then you get the substrate, pre-treatment, primer, top coat, and then clear coat uh, is optional depending on what the end use may be. Again, this is all the top coat and primer all together is left with you know, human hair or piece of cellophane. It's all dependent on what the requirements are. Your, what your, re your specifications are. That's what we determine what the coating is going to be and how many layers of film it's going to have on Again, the weathering. Exposure to ultraviolet light is what affects the color and durability uh, of, of any roof or, or metal building project. Um, the coating industry is constantly testing and evaluating how weather interacts with the paint. We'll show you that. Um, our testing facilities in Fort Myers, Florida. We have a couple of slides that touch on that. Um, and it's a combination that, excuse me, it's a combination of the paint of following that breaks down the coating molecules. The exposure to sun, moisture and humidity, uh, high temperatures, and temperature fluctuations. That's why we have our facility in Fort Myers, Florida. That's one of the most aggressive environments in the continental United States. So southwest facing um, exposure is about as aggressive as we can really replicate. So we're at the mercy of Mother Nature. So whatever weather she throws at us, and that we have to make sure that that coating performs in all those different uh, climates, different geographic locations within North America. So the picture on the left is a picture from our testing facility in Fort Myers, Florida. It is real life exposure, 45 degree angle panels on a test bed and we have them documented and, and 
and then test them periodically and, and see how they weather, fade, do different physical properties on them. Um, whenever that allows. And here on the right is an accelerated testing cabinet. So we have QUV light bulbs that shine on these panels in the, in the same way you see there on the left, um, depending on what tests we're running for several thousands of hours, depending on what, on what we're trying to, trying to replicate there. So that's an accelerated testing cabinet on the right. What we have is about 125,000 panels at that test site, at that farm in Fort Myers. And before we bring anything to market to you, we have it on exposure for five years to test it, to see what the durability is going to be, the weathering, is it going to perform? Because we're warranting it, we have to make sure that it's going to live up to those expectations. And we'll do our testing, test the resin, test the pigment, all that, to make sure we know how it's going to perform. And Fort Myers gives us an ideal location because it's constantly getting high temperature UV, moisture, rain, wet and dry cycles all the time. So it's an ideal site to test what the performance criteria is going to be for a coating and what the life cycle is going to be. That's those cabinets on the right that he just showed you. They simulate what happens out on that vent, but it's accelerated and it's kept in hours. And it, there are cabinets in that that have chemicals in them that simulate what's happening out in the environment. <coughs> This picture of the test site, as you can see, it covers, I think we've got uh, about 40 acres there, and there's just, like I said, 125,000 panels. And you can see the variations of color. We're monitoring that, we're testing those, and saying, okay, this is a keeper, this one's got to go. These pigments are not good, these are the ones that we're going with. And it gives us, tells us what the performance is. You can see the magnitude of how much the testing. Uh, effect or impact what we're going to come to market with. We have panels out there, Jerry, 50 plus years old now, yeah. from going back to right. some of our original uh, four polymer uh, panels. We had more. Um, some of the weather, Hurricane Andrew in particular, destroyed our. They told you to yeah. um, So. This is what we had left. We have had some damage to a previous Fort Myers facility, but we still were able to keep we a, moved few in racks, in a few racks worth of, of the really old ones are still out there. So there's panels on those fences that are probably older than everybody in this room this age. So, and they're twice, they're, they're 30 years <laughs> older than <laughs> this gentleman right here is giving you the presentation. But it really gives us a lot of hard data of what we can go to market with and what we can take to you and make a commitment to you. And we've got a coating that's going to perform and live up to your expectations. Coating failures. So we're chalking. As I said, uh, as the resin system breaks down, particles take on a powdery appearance that's embedded in the pigment, and the particles lose film adhesion. That gives the appearance of the color fading. In fact, but it's not. It's out of film caused by degradation of the resin, this is due to exposure to UV rays. Uh, fading is premature or excessive lighting of the coating color and the color retention. Uh, and again, fading is also caused by the UV and the hydrolytic substances of the environment attacking the pigment portion of the coating. And those can vary um, back when acid rain was, was a problem and things like that. Uh, color fade is measured with a delta E measurement. Um, when we come out to a job site or a, a claim situation, we will, it looks like a, an old Kodak, Kodak camera that you would just press on the, on the substrate and it measures the, the light reflection, the delta E measurement, that's how we, we measure phase. Then we'll detect the difference of about one delta E. I know that's brief and we're not going to get into a chemistry class today, but it's important and that and we're able to see what the exposure is. And that instrumentation we go out to the field will tell us how much of a fade has occurred. Is it premature or is it within spec? That pretty much it, it measures the light, shines a light on it, it measures the reflection of that light on there. And as pigments change, that angle changes. And that is the delta measure. Uh, blistering represents a localized loss of adhesion. 
you know, lifting of the coating film from the underlying surface that can be caused by a number of things, heat, moisture, or a combination of both. Um, eventually it leads to a complete delamination of the substrate. Um, it sometimes be caused by improper drying or curing of the coated material. Um, but we have ways of working with the coders, going back to retains, batch retains, both wet and uh, physical, on uh, trying to we get a blistering scenario or anything, we would go back to do uh, <coughs> retains, both at the coder and the coating manufacturer. Yeah, one of the problems that we encounter quite frequently is not having the end user educated. They leave panels nested out on a job site in all types of weather conditions, and they don't protect them from cover. So you get moisture that does wicking, crawls in between the panels, and that and softens up the coating. The next thing you have is blister. And now we have a problem on there because now the product is not going to perform to what we state in the warranty, and then we have an issue because it was properly put on the site, improperly put on the site to take care of. So we try to encourage everybody, when it gets to the job site, try to erect it as soon as possible. Don't let it get wet. Don't let the elements get on. And then go out and all of a sudden say, I better put a tarp on that and cover it up. Because now if it dries and you get the hot and the sunshine comes up, you made a humidity cabinet in there, which causes it to even blister worse. And then you have a bigger problem. So we try to caution everybody how you store and protect the panels on the job site. American standard testing, outdoor weather exposure, retention of color and gloss, solar reflected UV. There are a litany of different ASTM testing out there. Um, salt spray, humidity cabinets, film and thick film thickness, hardness, can be measured in a number of different ways. Um, we'll get to some of those later. We'll go through every single one of them on the... We're held to a very high standard. It's just like in your home, your appliances that have UL written on tags on, on your refrigerator, your washer dryer, dishwasher, and that you'll see UL. They're held to a standard and we are held to a performance standard using ASTM. They write spec, not us. This organization writes the spec and we have to comply with that and make sure that our coatings meet all those requirements. Factors consider when specifying metal coatings. Uh, geographical location is key. Natural elements and weather. Substrate, end use, desired color, desired warranty. Those two can go hand in hand as we talked earlier applicator and coder. As Jerry was talking about, the essentials to keep dry, store the coils on a clean, smooth surface, avoid handling damage when possible, use as quickly as possible. Um, best practices are inside storage, controlled environment, temperature controlled environment if possible. Again, avoid condensation buildup. Use dedicated storage facilities and avoid double stacking of coils if possible. Jerry, what's that coming in here? Again, touching on sheet storage and handling. This is on the job side that Jerry was talking about. Number one, mission critical keep dry, avoid handling damage that can lead to um, film integrity issues. Uh, use promptly, again, use as quickly as possible. Inside storage, temperature control. Again, most important, keep dry and use as quick as possible. And you'll see redundant in this, but we can't emphasize enough because we run into this almost every day. One of our guys in, in the United States will get a call, come to the job site, and what do we see? We see where they've been left out, unprotected, out the environment, with all the rain, all the elements, snow, salt, whatever, on top of them. And then all of a sudden they say, we got a problem. We ran it through our roll former. Well, through there, we, the paint's peeling off. Or we've got tissues that's got blood <coughs> on the surface. The surface is not, not nice and smooth, like it should be. That concludes the presentation or the slide deck part of our presentation. We have some visual aids, and then I'd like to uh, 
open the floor up for questions. Anybody that may have some? Surely there's some questions. Go ahead. I have a customer that calls me and says, my roof's been on 18 years. I'm sorry, say again. I have a customer that maybe calls me and says, my roof's been on there 18 years. Yeah. The faded is crazy. Okay. I go out and look. Okay. And we do the, the cleaning thing. It's not faded, it's chunked. Not a warranty issue. Yeah. Next question I get is, well, what do I clean it with to get it back to looking at the store out here? We have cleaning recommendations on our website. Instructions on how to clean because people ask that all the time. They go to a local hardware store, Home Depot, and they buy a very abrasive or a harsh cleaner or a chemical and put it on there. Now you've got to create a bigger problem because now you'll have discoloration all over that paint and surface and it will not recover. Once you've damaged the integrity of that pigment, you're not going to get it to recover. So we have very explicit cleaning uh, details on the website that tells you how to properly clean the surface of there. Also, if you run into a situation where you have graffiti, or kids that come up and spray paint and all that on there, and written on it, we have a graffiti removal system that a lot of people don't know about, called GRF, graffiti removal system, that you can lock and clean that graffiti right off and will not hurt the integrity of the painted surface. That. So that's something kind of unique that we're trying to kind of proud of. Uh, definitely, it's because we see it all the time. In Coda, bus stop, subway station, you see it on railroad cars, you see it on trucks. Where don't you see graffiti today? You see it everywhere. And we're fortunate that we have a coating where we can go out. We have some cities and uh, localities that have to go out every day and clean stuff off the side of painted buildings. And that because they've been defaced with some type of graffiti on there bad language, bad words, whatever that has to be taken off and that's so uh, we're very fortunate that we have that coding that can do that. So is there anything about warranty, about performance, about the different families of coding? And as I said, good, better, best. I don't know, how many of you in here put out metal buildings? Just one person? How many of you do with painted metal buildings? So everybody. So what could for you? What capacity do you deal with painted metal? Most is siliconized. Oh, yours is mostly siliconized. Mm -hmm. What about the gentleman right there, right, right here, with your wife? You, yep. I buy from United Steel. You buy yeah, United that's Steel. So not by the box. Yeah, that's still yeah. nice. And they, <laughs> United Steel has it coated, it's either Jeffersonville, Indiana, or in Butler, Indiana, on one of these paint lines that we showed you in here. And they are excellent people to do applications. And they do a great job. They're one of the most respected in the industry today. Does their uh, is their product is that? A, I'm sorry. The paint they use is that? A, I have to whisper. A, that's sure. A, what S and P or a yeah, that's that's S and P. Yeah, S and P. Yeah. Our trade name is Weather XL for S and P. Right. Or S and P is short for Siliconized Modified Polyester. Right. So Weather XL works. Yeah, yeah. Weather XL is an SMP. That's, an our, that's our trade name that's for it. Um, you know, the other ones are 1050 with our competitors. Now, I told you about all the paint lines that are in the country. We're very fortunate that we have a whole cadre of technical service people that live in all these paint lines. They're there all the time to monitor and coach and work with the people to make sure the people that run the paint lines and have the paint lines are applying it correctly. So we have technical service people assigned to all the paint lines in the United States. Now I've got these show and tell stuff. On your way out, I'm not kicking you out yet, but these are, this is a, pretty much a cliff notes of what we went over. A coding 101, kind of catch all guide, has some good graphics here of a coil line, kind of goes through the, uh, the failures, the differences between PDF, S and P, and polyester. So if you'd like, feel free to have one of those. And if we don't have, if we have to run out of something, leave a card, give us your name and address, and we'll get it to you. Here's a unique coating, right? Go ahead, I'm sorry. Question for you, what, uh, what is it in the floor pond that keeps the colors from fading? The, the resin, and that, the Kynar resin, and that, and I know we didn't bring that from the pond, but it's mined out of the earth, and that, and it's, but we do not make it, but it's under that family, you saw the four components, like right here, <coughs> I 
is this one right here it's called the resin. So this is really the critical backbone of the paint. Based on which one you buy, whether it's a polyester, an SMT, or a Kyanar, determines what resin system you use, makes up the backbone of the performance of that product. So like on the first one he showed you polyester, a lot of that is white we use for liner panels. So all of you who buy painted coil, buy polyester, that's what we use on the interior because it's not exposed to all the critical elements on the outside environment. And then these are the four components that we told you about. Here's the pigment, here's the additive, and I'll pass this around, the resin and solvent. You want to see what it looks like? And then <coughs> Jerry is referring to the PDF resin as Kydar. Kydar is a trade name right. of Arkema for PDF resin. Um, that is the common, that's what it's referred to in the industry. Most often people call PDF Kydar. It's kind of the inverse. Uh, Kydar is a PDF resin. It's just a trade name of Arkema. There's uh, some other suppliers for it that we use and our competitors use as well that offer PDF resin. Kydar is kind of the first one. So that's the, everyone refers to PDF as Kydar. Now earlier we told you about bright exotic colors. So here's a little chart that I kind of put together. Ken's felt trouble. Now you see Shell, Gas Station, BP, Wendy's, Pizza Hut, and all these people have to use these bright exotic colors. Well, they know going into this that it's not going to have a 20 or 30 year warranty on it. And that, so this, when I say it spells out trouble, these are the kind of colors that get you in trouble because we have to use the organic pigments to get these bright colors. And they are not the best performers when they're exposed to the elements out there. So we try to educate people. Yes, it looks great. It has a nice pop to it. But it's not going to give you the long-term performance that you want. So it can be double-edged too, because some of these are more expensive. They're typically going to be more expensive, <coughs> and they don't last as long. So that can be a problem coming and going. So, so can you get those in Kynar? Kind of I'm sorry? sorry? No, you, you get can't those? get the bright colors in Kynar. Kind of we do have a, a product called Valflon, and we can make some bright colors on. But I got to tell you, it's very, very expensive. Very expensive. We delivered in a Wells Fargo truck. <laughs> Here's a unique coating right here. I don't know if the light does it justice, but this is something new in our family that came out a couple years ago called Chameleon. Now I have a, this particular panel came off of a good friend of mine. He's a president of one of the big panel manufacturers in the country. He did his entire house in this product. It's called Chameleon. I know you shake your head, but what's unique about this is that if I would have had the proper light source, it change, it's constantly changing color every time the light hits it. If you can see it, how many different colors, special effects and that. He did his entire house of this. And all day long, traffic is coming Be by his careful, house. People are stopping, watching. He's in Sacramento. As the light source changes, the sun changes, his house is changing colors of all four sides. As different light sources did it, it's changing colors all day. I know you shake your head, but I'll tell you what. It's funny because when I was out there with him, when they were arresting the house, the, the Department of Natural Resources said that would be great. That's a great thing. And so they decided to do their building out in Sacramento because they wanted it because it's unique to the environment because it's constantly changing color and not just a standard old block, earth tone type color that's out there. Now, here's a, pro here's a uh, something that also we do, print coats. So you put a base coat down, you put an ink over top of it, and you get a wood grain finish. So we have different products that can give you that appearance to give you print coat. You'll see how many people, well, probably not in here, but there are people who have above ground pools, and you see all the skirting around the pool, wood grain, they use this product. Keep in mind, our coatings go over aluminum, they go over hot dead galvanized, and they go over galvanized. So all metal substrates we can put a the coating over. So, and every one of them, we recommend you put a primer on and then the top coat. But total thickness for the primer and the top coat, again, one mil. <coughs> so, this is what I'm talking about. So you can't expect it to be bulletproof. Beat it up, because that's the thickness of it right there. I took this off of a, some guy. I tried to get him to stop, smoke, stop smoking, so I took his thing off. But that's, that's the thickness right there. That's one mil. So when you're buying painted metal, that's the thickness right there. So you've got to be careful in handling it. 
and that, and storing it, and when you're erecting it. All right, what else do we have here? I wanted to show you people have it. Why do you need a clear coat? We have coating on here where you here's the belt, here's the metal, the bare substrate, here's the primer, here's the color coat, then we put a clear coat on top of it because some colors require a clear coat. We have some people have specifications say, I need that film thicker than one mil. If we're doing a government job, they'll come in and say, we need two mil, three mil, or four mil for some of their military bases. So we have to have coating, and we have a whole family of coating that can meet those requirements. So we can put it on thicker. There's another product that we didn't even talk about on here, I don't know if you're familiar with it, it's called Foxasol. I don't know if any of you ever heard of it, but it'll go up to eight mil, 12 mil thick. And that so and sometimes we'll recommend that for putting on steel mill or heavily uh, loads of environment where they're making products where there's a lot of chemicals and fumes inside the building and we'll tell them because in the mind of people they're saying thicker is better that's not always the case it depends on the application and what the installation is or the facility that you're building all right let's see here's Another product that we came out with, and I'll pass some of these around, Nova, with a sparkle coating. I'm gonna pass that around. So again, people use these for accent colors, corporate identity, and that, but these are very unique. We put a special slate inside those, in that coating, to give it that appearance. If you worked in our laboratory, you'd have to know what this is. And it's not a stick to beat you with or a club. You said my dad used to have one. <laughs> dad used to have one? <laughs> <laughs> it's in your backside. Okay. So, this is called a draw bar. So when we get a color chip from somebody, one of our customers, and we have to make a, a, a color for them, match it, we have to take the metal, put the primer on, and this is what our lab has to do because each one of these are gauged to give you a certain film thickness. And that's it's like piano wire wrapped around the bar. And they very slowly slide this down on there, and then they put it in an oven and bake it out, and then we have instrumentation to measure this to make sure we got one mil. But everybody in our lab needs to use the sensor when they're matching colors. And we probably have, what, 30, 40 different people that are do nothing but color match. We do 1,500 to 2,000 color matches a month. And that, so that's a lot of color matches. But this is a very good thing. Cool. Draw it down there, and then we will put it in a, an industrial oven, and hold it smaller than the, than the display string there. And for, depending on what the end use is, uh, a certain amount of time, it's around 30 to 40 seconds. And Temperature is how you can get, uh, fluctuate color as well. So if we're looking to draw, dial in a certain color, heat can affect that by so long put it in the oven. We didn't go into that on all the instrumentation that's used both on a paint line and our laboratory, but it's synchronized. Our equipment mirrors the equipment that's on a paint line because we have to give them the same results that we're getting in the lab. Here's just a little brief of some of the physical properties we do. We have a thing called <coughs> a reverse impact device that drops the bolt down on there and pops the, the panel out. And then we tape it with Scotch 610 tape to see if any of the paint's going to pick off. Now we know it's properly cured and adheres to the surface that the metal's been cleaned right and it sticks. We take MEK, which is a, you can buy that at, at, at any of the hardware stores, a very harsh solvent, and we do 100 rubs on there with cheesecloth and that to make sure we got the right cure that the paint will pick up. So there's a multitude of tests that we have to do on every panel before we ship it out to the customer because we know it's going to go through that type of, of you know, equipment that's going to be harsh and, and tough on it and it's got to be able to withstand that. So we have to do all that testing. The paint line, we send it to the paint line, we've already done this test. When they run it on that paint line that we saw, they do the same identical thing before it goes to the recoiler and before it goes out to you. Because if it's not done, we know when it gets to your job site or to your facility, it's going to fail. And you're going to be calling somebody 
come out here, we got a problem. Is there any, any other questions you want to talk about? Is there anything that we haven't discussed that, you know, that you deal with paint every day? Because I know we gave you a brief, a quick view, but I just thought we'd hit on the high points and that and try to tell you, hey, this is what Coding 101 is. It's a very sophisticated business, a very sophisticated sophisticated process and we have probably 40 or 50 PhDs and residents of chemists that work in our lab that do nothing but develop and come up. We are pretty proud that we have the most extensive collection of coding in the market. So whatever your requirement is, if you see a truck trailer going down the highway, painter, I don't care who it is, Great Dane, Hyundai, whoever, we supply the painting, Wabash, all the painting for truck trailers. All the paint to mobile home RV manufacturers, to horse trailer people. So we supply for every end use, gutters, downspouts, storm doors, garage doors, anything that's metal, we supply a coating for. You name it, we're involved in it, to supply coating for those different applications. Each one has its own performance characteristics that we have to meet. People don't care if a horse trailer lasts 20 years or 10 years. They get beat up in that anyway. Same way you know, people go up and deal with gutters and down stuff. Hey, we just want functionality. We want to make sure that it's carrying the water. Metal roofs and that. So all those have certain specifications and requirements that we have to meet. And we have to be told, hey, is this going on a roof? Is it going on a wall? Is it going on a truck trailer? We do all the appliances for Westinghouse and uh, GE and all those in your home. We supply all the coating for all the for Every end use where there is metal used, we have an application for it. So I'm sure you're tired of hearing me blabber. So if you have any other questions, please feel free to ask. Yes? Yeah. Um, quite a good question. All right. Uh, so we started purchasing metal from another supplier out of Chicago, or Chicago area. Okay. It's called Deep Metal. Um, okay. Basically, um, metal felt thinner, however, it was miking out at the exact same as uh, coated metal back away. They were all within a certain variant. When you're miking it, did it have the coating on it, or were you miking it as the bare substrate? No, uh, it did have the, they all had the coating. They all had the coating. Yes. Okay. Um, however, if you put that one square foot of metal on the scale versus PMG or uh, back away metal, then you can deploy are we talking hot dip galvanite? Are we talking galvanite? We don't know what the substrate is, which metal it is. Probably galvanite. Probably galvanite, because that's what McElroy might be doing. So in that, how are they making up? Are they making up their thickness in the coating? Or how are they making up? Typically, the coating is the same, but you have to look at what metal. So if it's galvanite, or if it's hot dead galvanized, you're looking at G40, G60, G90, so there's different variants in that of uh, the galvanizing is on the surface of that metal. So I'm not sure exactly so it may what you're getting. Maybe the actual yeah, so I, I, right. I'm not sure, but that's how they, and they might be done. Yeah. Okay, the you. coating, as far as the dry film thickness, when it's finished, after it's baked and gone through life, is the same. So we're looking at one mil, regardless yeah, there's of the metal. There's not going to be any coder that's going to be looking to put extra film right. on it. Can you more cost for them? So yeah, that's probably the uh, the treatment. You know, like you say, the galvanizing, the galvanizing thing. You can put too much top coat on it, and then you start to go the other way. You drop off, and you lose the coat of the product. So it's very critical that you keep it in that window, getting the proper film thickness on it, or you can have too not enough. Or you can have too much. So it's critical that you have the proper amount. Any other questions? Yes. Film hardness in, in, as regards to uh, stress resistance. I've had a few complaints over here buying, and I noticed that most of them had to do with PVDF coats. That's correct. Uh, is that a, a known to softer resin, or was it that particular resin? Yeah, absolutely. You hit on all cylinders. Pinar is a softer resin than polyester family. It's SMB or polyester. They're much harder. And, uh, and this is a thermal plastic resin system that's coming out and it is soft. Yes, it has better performance, but a lot of people who use kind of or well, our trade name for it, put field coats on it, and the layer was strippable for field coats. 
people, a lot of people in the industry will put that on there to protect the surface. So when it gets to the job site, you don't have it. So when you're dragging the panels off, you're not scratching the braid of the panel. Just feel to say what that? Right, yeah. So they do that. But there is nothing you can, we've come up, we've toyed with it and played around with it, what you can do with that resin to make it a little harder. We have one called Corcon Extreme. So we have been able to increase toughness of it, but that is one of the inherent characteristics of Kynar or 500 uh, floor polymer finishes. They are softer than the other family of coatings, polyester coatings. And also, they're, they're more flexible as well, which is also a, a benefit to some of the architectural and like standing seam in you. Uh, yeah, they have a real tight radius on there, so it gives you more flexibility. Polyester and SFP are much more, much harder, so you're not as flexible then real tight radius then out of there without the paint fracturing. What we call enveloping up. So yes. How involved is Sherman Williams in the warranty claim process that you had people stay to leave that patient? We stay away from warranty. Which is what I say. No, but we have, you know, if there's an issue in the field, we have a protocol that we follow. We get with the coder and we will either make a job site visit. First, we gather the data. We will look at retains, we'll go to the paint lines, look at what they've run, we do all the physical testing, and then if everything is compliant and meets that, all those requirements, and they say, hey, we've got a problem. Up. We can go out to the, jo the job site, joint call with them, we'll try to take a sample, or we'll do on-site testing to see what we can determine what the failure mode is. So, but if it's our problem, if it's a paint problem, I can tell you that I've been in the business a lot of years. I know I don't look it, but I have been. I've been this for a long time. We'll fix the claim. We step up and fix it. It's our fault. We fix it. Uh, keeping track of your coil, coil numbers, for those of you that buy coil, is the most important part of that process. It has to follow the supply chain back there. So if you buy from a service center like the United Steel or whoever, they will have that coil number. Give it to you, you must you have to keep that. So if there is a claim, that's how we know where it was coded, when it was coded, when it was coded. Until the time, when, where, and that's how we will gather the retains and we get it done. But we have never stepped away from the claim. <coughs> and we were once South Bar about 18 months ago, well, you may know that, and we were acquired by Sherman Williams. And that has carried over to Sherman Williams. So we are responsible. So if it's our our issue, our problem, failure, improvement we are, we will fix it. And that's stated very clearly in our warranty to the coder to the end user. And that coil number is how we identify that it is our pain. Uh, usually in a claim situation, if something goes south and the customer is unhappy, it usually comes back that we can't figure out who painted it or where it was painted. Right. All because of, for some reason, the coil number has been lost because someone went out of business or something. One of the things I want to caution you about today that happens quite on a more frequent basis than we like is people will say, hey, I'm getting a better price than this guy, and you'll get me this color. And all of a sudden, we're mixing two different, same color, mixing two different paint suppliers on there, and now you're going to have a horror story on your hands because you're going to get differential weathering because we don't make the paint the same way. So our competitors have one way of making it. We have our own way of processing and making coating. And we highly encourage you to don't mix and match other sources unless you have to. Okay. Is it the same system? Is it a Valspar Sherman Williams system or the Brand X? If you don't want to mix it, yes, it looks the same day one. But I can tell you, five years, seven years down the road, you're going to have differential weathering. And it's going to look like a quilt with different colors on there. And you don't want that. And it, yeah, go ahead. Some of the wool farmers are, are making a big deal of spraying on heating the panel before the wool farm. It's supposed to uh, all the Can you speak to that? Is it beneficial or not? Well, there's, a, there's probably a mixed bag of thoughts on that. That's, I have several customers that I deal with that do the heating process, and, that, and they sell that, they market that, that it's created, it gives better formability, and that because they have an ambient temperature or higher, so you don't have cold metal doing it. So I can tell you, I've seen it both ways, and it all depends on that. I have there's certain customers we deal with that really market that it's preheated. 
that out. But I, I, if it's done right and you have it in the right environment, you're not going to have it. I can tell you we don't formulate a special coding system for a heat and handle the first one or the other. Um, that's a conversation that the coding manufacturers are trying to prefer to stay out of. You know, there's benefits to it. Um, it's not necessary. You know, we, there's a uh, U.S. Steel has a white paper on it that outlines the, the pros and the cons. Right. So. Yep. Whenever you guys are uh, coating steel or aluminum, is there any difference in either your testing or applying the paint or everything exactly the same? On the different metal substrates? Yes. Okay. <coughs> yeah, there are different requirements because of the treatment is different on aluminum versus it is on steel. We are fortunate that in our product, we have a universal primer and top that will work on all three of those substrates. Depending on what the end use is, tells us what the physical properties have to be for that product that you're asking about. So if it's for a roof panel, or if it's for a truck trailer, or if it's for a mobile home, every one of them has a different specification as to what the bend and the requirements have to be on that product. We have to incorporate and build that into the product to allow us to be able to perform to that, whatever the radius or whatever the performance requirements are. Else? Are you concerned at all about the environment closer to the ocean that they all spray? Yeah, we are very concerned about it. And we have a unique family of coatings that we apply for a coastal installation. It's called four thing coastal. And that so you can put it right on the edge of the water and we will warrant that. Uh, now you gotta make sure the other components are right. Good steel, good metal, good treatment, who the coater is. And our product is called four thing coastal. So we get challenged with that a lot. So we know that's going to that happen, and you're going to have installations that are going to be along the coastline, around salt water, brackish water. So we have coatings that will perform that type of environment. For most warranty states, 1,500 feet from the coastline, boy, most warranties, unless it's a supply. Our, our four day coastal, there is no minimum price distance from the shoreline. So now, if you take one of these standard coatings we just talked about here, the typical rule of thumb in a warranty will say 1,500 feet from the water's edge. So we have people say, well, wait a minute, I'm building a condo complex that's going to be right on the water or the marina or whatever. So we came up with a very unique coating called Sportane Coastal. It's a special, unique chemistry that will perform in that harsh environment. Yeah, and we offer a 20-year warranty. Yep. Anything else? You've been a great audience today. We appreciate your tolerance and putting up with us. We hope we didn't go too far over your head, but there's a lot to know about where we're coding. And that. So if you have any questions, please feel free to contact us. We'll try to answer any questions you have. We'll give you more literature. And that. So just let us know. And most of all, we thank you for using our coding system.